Our first question is, uh, how and why did you choose this career? Um, I think essentially, I'm just a frustrated farmer. Um, my relatives started a thousand acre farm in Michigan. And uh, my dad went on to start one of the first accredited graduate programs in environmental engineering at St. Louis at Washington University. And my uncle went on to be the dean of the School of in Engineering at uh, University of Dayton. So uh, we had that kind of transition from farming to environmental engineering and trying to figure out how to clean up, uh, clean up our environment. And uh, basically, I guess my relatives were my mentors. And... Um, I sort of, when I graduated from Clemson in 1975, um, I took a little bit of a change and focused on hazardous waste site cleanups and, uh, uh, you know, with the passage of the Resource Conservation and Recovery Act and uh, with the emphasis on basically cleaning up uh, soil and groundwater contaminated sites. And now the emphasis is really focused more on pollution prevention and sustainable types of ways to to clean the environment up and not have too big of an impact on our economy. So that's basically, mm -hmm. I enjoy uh, having one hand on a shovel and the other hand on a computer. So that's kind of what environmental engineers do. At least we're more of an environmental uh, contracting firm. A lot of companies separate engineering uh, from contracting. And the problem is when you're dealing with the environment, you can't, a lot of the things that happen, you can't scope or design what you can't see. A lot of the reactions with chemicals after they leave a container, uh, they're no longer the same material. They change when they interact with the air and water and the environment. And when you start trying to look at cleaning up soil and groundwater sites, hazardous waste sites, landfills, you almost say, it's almost like exploratory surgery. When you open the patient up, you see what you've got and you've got to figure out how to fix it. So it, it requires to have to be able to react to that, but also figure out a way to resolve solve problems and, from a good stewardship standpoint. Thanks so much for that. All right. Our next question is: What is a typical day in your work life like? Um, we're a little bit unusual because um, we're pretty much horizontally spread. Mm -hmm. um, we do everything from train derailments to plane explosions and fires, cleanups, uh, soil and groundwater cleanups. Um, so we're on 24-7 call. We're also the Ebola contractor for Cobb County and uh, several counties, which will probably never happen. But <laughs> we're essentially what I call applied environmental health engineers that basically can do everything from um, <clears throat> air, water, solid waste, industrial hygiene, um, health and uh, safety. And it's basically, it's, environmental engineering is really where you're looking at all of God's creation. And it, revolves, and it involves all disciplines. And uh, so, so the more you learn, the more you find out you don't know. Mm -hmm. uh, to be a, an environmental engineer, it used to be that you couldn't really get the coursework until you got your doctorate degree. Uh, I've got three degrees, but... Um, you know, you need to be well versed in um, basically uh, clean water processes and how how materials react in the environment. In the environment, how they uh, how materials move from the source and the pathways and the fate of materials in the environment where they end up. And and in order to do that, you have to understand mass transport transport mechanisms through air, water, soil, groundwater. And that's all disciplines. It's microbiology, it's geology, it's chemical engineering, mm -hmm. it's electrical engineering. You get when you look at all the different methodologies that are used to to solve, you know, air, water, and solid waste, and soil and groundwater pollution. It involves all disciplines. So uh, you can't, and and it's, and it's very difficult to cover them all. Okay. Thank okay. you. Um. That leads well into the next question. Which is, uh, so what high school and college courses have you found to be, you know, the most useful for your occupation? Um, I think it's a, you, you try to find out what your God-given talents are. Um, I would say that, you know, generally speaking, people that go into uh, environmental 
fields. Uh, some people have the propensity to excel in uh, education, research and development, or in, in separate disciplines. Um, and then you can look at um, contracting to people actually physically do the work. Um, the courses I enjoyed the most, I think, I, I'm more of a water guy. I like uh, I, I liked hydraulics, hydrology, lakes, um, soil, soils engineering. Um, in terms of uh, at least the coursework I took, I took basically have a degree in mathematics and a degree in civil engineering from Clemson, then a master's in environmental systems engineering from Clemson. And Clemson's starting to learn how to play football, but they just <laughs> made it a ways to go um, against Alabama because they're pretty tough. Um, I'd have to say that probably when you're in school, it, when I look at all the courses I've taken and everything, I think there's two or three professors that stand out that really take an interest in you and motivate you. Um, and you, you also find out just what are your, when you start doing something and you get, and you get an affirmation from other people, then you know you're in the right area. Mm -hmm. So uh, it's a matter of trying to find out what are your gifts and how do they align up with the marketplace. And you try to pick a market that's going to uh, last long enough mm -hmm. so you can continue to pull down a reasonable income. Right. And that's tough for young people today because now it, it, they'll end up having several jobs, like seven jobs on the average, whereas it used to be back in my day, you'd have one one job for 30 years and never have a pension when you retire. <laughs> right. That doesn't really happen too much anymore. Yeah. And then our next question will be... What are the most and least rewarding aspects of your job? I think the, uh, the, most, the most rewarding is uh, when you deal with um, emergency response problems, and in other words, when you deal with mistakes of other people, you become an excellent problem solver. And you can, I've responded to over 6,000 incidents since, since 1975, which range from plant explosions to derailments to spills to fires. And you see how systems react and how they fail, so you can design systems that prevent incidents better. The most disappointing part is that there really is no emphasis placed on um, what I call uh, integrity or qualifications other than professional engineering degrees or certified professional geologists. Generally, this whole market is price-driven and it's not driven based on um, expertise and saving money over the long run. I'd say most companies look at environmental issues as being an expense on the expense side of the curve. They don't look at how much money they can save if they do it the right way the first time. Mm -hmm. um, and I think from that perspective, that's been a little has been a little bit disappointing. Like for instance, I'm a diplomat in the Academy of Environmental Engineers, and I'm involved in helping writing the examinations that people have to take in engineering. But uh, when you get out in the marketplace, um, it's sort of like uh, our healthcare systems. You're, we're separated more than more because of the cost of healthcare and med the medical practice by practitioners or nurses rather than the professionals, and just to keep the cost down. Mm -hmm. And it's the same way with professional en professional engineers. And, and I'd have to say that in the environmental industry and hazardous waste engineering, there's a lot of self-declared experts. Uh, and, and for the most part, like I've gone to the trouble to become a certified diplomat in hazardous waste and uh, site remediations, which is after you've been a PE for eight years and also in water wastewater management, which is after you've become a PE, then you're examined uh, by your peers in a written exam, then you have to take an oral exam. They look at uh, integrity, uh, your honesty, and just basically your overall social uh, commitment to really put public health and safety over compensation. And for the most part, most people don't care about that. They just care about we don't look at our waste products. We don't really look at issues. We're more concerned about the price, and they don't really look at your, your qualifications until after there's an accident that they're forced to. Yeah. And I think one of the biggest problems is it's hard to share uh, lessons learned uh, because a lot of incidents that happen in the environment don't happen frequently enough, so it's hard to train your replacement, and, hard, and it's hard to share that experience so you can prevent from making the same mistakes over and over and over and over again. That's what I see happening. It's, it's really unfortunate, but I think it's part of human nature, though, too. So. I believe we just have one last question for you. Any words of advice for a person seeking a career in this field? 
Um, I think you just have to look at there's so many different opportunities in the environmental field. I think right now, um, if you look at the environment, it's not it's not being given the same emphasis as like IT areas and certain areas of medicine. You have to pick a niche that lines up with your talent base. And I think the best thing you can do is, is do like you're doing. It's a market survey. You don't go ask for a job. You go find out what other people would recommend. Find out what other people are doing and find out, find out how, you, how can I plug into what other people are doing so I'm using my talent base uh, so you're, you're growing in areas that, that you're designed to grow in. And the best way you can do that is go and ask questions because there's so many different fields. You, you know, and, and one of the things I've noticed is that um, most of the projects we get involved in, people have become so specialized they miss addressing fundamental questions and that's why the systems, that's why the projects fail. Most projects we get involved in is they don't look at the big picture, the whole total system, the whole project. That whenever you design any system or do anything, there is it interacts uh, with the entire system. And most people, uh, a lot of engineers don't get out from behind their desk and they design stuff that doesn't work. When you get in the field, we spend a lot of time in the field correcting problems that engineers have never gotten. Their, they don't get dirty. don't get out there and really see how to interact with a project. That's probably the biggest complaint I hear in working for major companies, uh, Fortune 500 companies, is that field engineers are always concerned about the fact that the engineers have designed their plants or have designed their systems um, without interacting with the operations personnel and, and making it work. So in terms of, you just have to, you know, from, from your perspective, I mean, you know, right now it's tough. Uh, with online applications and stuff, it's hard to break through that and talk to people personally to find out what's happening. Mm -hmm. And sometimes you don't know what you like until you try it's a good idea. Like, you know, Chick-fil-A, you have to work on a, with them for like six or six months or a year as an intern before you can get a full-time job. And having part-time jobs, it, it helps. If you know what you want to do when you're going through school, it helps you put up with the, the pain and suffering and going mm -hmm. through the tougher courses to get there. So, um, you know, there's, there's state jobs. There's jobs in education. There's jobs with industry. Um, there's jobs with contractors. There's jobs with engineering firms consulting firms, um, jobs with lobby groups, you know, all types of firms. But the point is you got to find out who's hiring and who's doing it. And right now, the environmental area is not given the emphasis as, as it was before. So in terms of it being, the, you know, I, if, I, if I were starting what I'm doing now, I'm not sure that I'd be doing what I'm doing now. However, everything we do has been reacting to a market condition and adjusting because we're a smaller company. But... Uh, you got to. I, I would suggest if you're looking at the environmental area that you really do your homework like you're doing now. Find out what's available, who's hiring, and, and what they're planning on doing in the future. You know, because it is, like I said, there's a real emphasis right now on on uh, basically companies becoming more profitable. And right now, it's pretty hard to become more profitable when you have to have the expense of cleaning uh, something up, unless you can show through being a better steward and not wasting things and recovering, making your process more efficient so there's less waste and you can save money in the long run. But most people, most companies don't have foresight. Or don't, we're, in a, we're in a culture that wants it now. Mm -hmm. They don't look at the long-term impact. So they want to just live with the problem until they retire and then they pass it on to somebody else. Then what happens, what happens is we've got all these landfills now because we didn't use trash, go trash to energy or incinerate waste now where we've got all these landfills are leaking and contaminating our groundwater supply. And this, if you look at Florida, it's like you can't hardly find a place that doesn't. Yes. So I mean, that all could have could have been avoided. But it's the same. It's, it's the same thing we're looking at now, where people are more interested in. I want it now. I don't care what the impact is down the road. So it'll. You know, I'm not saying there aren't opportunities. One of the reasons why we're on 24/7 calls is because nobody else wants to do it that has degrees and, you know, three degrees and stuff. The market is flooded in Atlanta with technical people. So you got to find out how you plug into that. So it's a matter of looking for a job, looking at your talent base, seeing what's out there, and don't limit it to geography. Because Atlanta is a hub that's got about everything. <laughs> so you have, have to really excel with a niche, niche to get ahead, or you may have to go someplace else where there's not quite the number of people to compete against. One of, Like I said, one of the things we've done is that most people, most professional engineers don't want to be on call 24-7.
don't want to give up their weekends or work on it. We do that. That's one of the things we do. So everybody just has to do like you're doing. It's a smart thing to do. Go around and ask people what the opportunities are, what they're doing, how, how can you plug into it. Then you line it up with your talent base and in terms of what you want to do and, and where you want to do it. And, and normally, um, you kind of know what that is anyway. And the other thing I'd suggest is there's some way to get some part-time experience trying it. Because it all gets down to people and relationships. You know, that's, that's, that's critical. Thank you so much for sure, your time. So much.